We encourage you to hit the subscribe button right now so you can listen to more podcasts of Operation Truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we do want to hear from you, so we encourage you to email us at directly at operationtruthofficial at gmail.com. I want you to know that your messages are likely to be heard, addressed, and listened to on air. Operation Truth, the show they don't want you to see. Now, here's your host, Lou. Hi, everyone. This is Lou Palumbo. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Tom Fuentes, a former assistant director of the FBI. And I might note, and his, an historian, he really is a very uh, astute and learned individual. I learned from Tom every time I talk to him, interestingly enough, which is why I've chased him around for about 10 years, you know, just picking his brain and listening to his perspectives on issues that we frequently speak about. I, I want to start out by just saying to everyone, if you're listening and you're participating through TikTok, you're able to communicate with us today, call in, and we can answer some questions for you if you have some. Tom and I want to remind you that this is not a, a platform of contention. We don't intend on insulting people. We intend on telling you the truth. You're going to find out that the truth sometimes is favorable for Democrats. Sometimes it's favorable for the Republicans. We don't have a tie to either one of these political entities. Our loyalties lie with this country and with our children. And interestingly enough, to speak for Tom again, if I may, this is a man that spent almost 30 years in the FBI protecting this country. For those of you that haven't heard some of his responsibilities, and I sound like I'm his PR guy, uh, Tom had headed up the international operation for the FBI, organized crime, counterterrorism. He's been involved in so many things with the Bureau and on the cutting edge that you almost can't keep track of it. But I want to get into a discussion right away about the borders. And I want to remind everyone that a podcast or two ago, I made mention that someone had uh, expressed an observation that we speak to the, to the borders all the time. And I'm going to continue to because it's our defining moment. If you don't believe that, start to listen to the mayors in many of your major cities like New York, Chicago, Denver, uh, Seattle, Austin, San Jose, Philadelphia, we're all suddenly um, feeling the impact of this. I, I wouldn't say it's an immigration policy. It doesn't appear that there's any policy. It just appears like it's a free for all coming into this country in excess of 10 million people through our southern border whom we know nothing about. Do not be misled by this administration. That is a lie. And if the Republicans were doing this, I would tell you the same thing. So don't think that this has any partisan attachment to it. I am gravely concerned about the future of this country because it translates to the young people, of which I have a few. In any event, um, if you follow what's going on in Denver, and this is just in the past week, apparently they they are overrun with migrants in their hospitals to the tune of over 22,000 visits. The hospital is in the red, $135 million dollars. What that basically says is that provide, they provided service to the tune of $135 million, and that's unrealized income. How are these cities supposed to continue to sustain themselves? Leading the charge with the loudest voice, ironically, is my home, the city of New York and Eric Adams. He's not been shy about telling you the immigration issue in New York City is going to destroy New York City. He is telling you we are experiencing a reduction in staff. Police, fire, sanitation, cutting into education because they're supporting the migrants illegally in the city of New York. Now we're emptying out high schools, James Madison High School in Brooklyn, and displacing these students during their school year so we can house migrants. I don't know where the morality is in this discussion. And if you listen to your Homeland Security, where a secure border. Although I have to tell you, oddly enough, a few days ago, the president said, the border isn't secure. So which way is it, number one? But he also stated that this has been going on for 10 years. Well, that brings it into your administration with Mr. Obama. So this is not your first time at the rodeo. What has to happen in this country? We had hearings last week where they're talking about impeaching Mallorca, which is minimally what they should do. They should criminally charge him for putting this country's safety and security at risk. And maybe that's a conversation they should point to the president. No one, regardless of political affiliation 
or what label you might have attached to your name that precedes your name gives you the right to put this country at risk. And your FBI director, Christopher Ray, pointed this out for us over six months ago. Are we living on planet crazy? It would be a novel idea if we could infuse some sanity and clarity in our thinking in this country. We are in a crisis, ladies and gentlemen. Make no bones about it. And I tell people the following, regardless if you're Republican or Democrat, we have a 17.6% increase in your cost of living. And I do realize that the wages have gone up, but not proportionately. We're suddenly realizing that this whole issue, which I've been talking about in this podcast, about transitioning to electricity, is a bust. Look what happened in the cold region of the this country. They, they couldn't charge the cars. The batteries deplete quicker in cold weather. The charging units froze. GM is getting, selling off all of their EV cars. Has the cuckoo left the clock? You shut down the Keystone Pipeline because of pressure from your progressive thinking people. Everybody's in, in, in favor of a, of a healthier planet and a better future for our children. For me, I don't care. I had my day in the sun. I won't speak for Tom, but I know he did as well. We're doing this podcast because we're gravely concerned about the young people here. Um, you know, we're, I, I have to say something interesting. You know, Albert Einstein, and I said this once before, he said the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, by but those who watch and do nothing. And that's what's going on here. I'm concerned that the majority of this country, and I use Tom's term complacent, apathetic, indifferent, distracted, whatever it is driving your state of mind, you better plug into what's going on in your country. Or these discussions about education will become what we call a moot point once the safety and the security of this, this country is gone. And your price of gasoline and your convenience is like being able to go to a food store any hour of the day and night and buy things in other, that other, in other parts of the world they can't do. But I want to bring Tom in right away because, you know, Tom knows I can go on and on and on like this. And it's not fair to him to to rant on. But, Tom, this immigration issue, you know, we mentioned between the two of us that someone had mentioned that we kind of beat this horse. This is the horse worth riding and worth beating. Your opinion. Well, I think, Lou, the, the proof of that is ongoing now with the primaries. You've had polls in Iowa and now polls in New Hampshire that have said that immigration and the border is probably the number one issue with the public. So when you have states like New Hampshire so far from the border that, you know, many people are saying every state, every city in the country is a border state or a border city. And New Hampshire is experiencing, they don't have a big city, really big city, not on the par with New York or Chicago or Philadelphia. But what they do have is a disproportionate large number of deaths <laughs> caused by fentanyl or overdosing on other opioid drugs. And they're saying that this is the result of the wide open border drugs that could be stopped at the Texas or Arizona or California, Mexico border are not being stopped. They're flooding into the country and they're flooding as far north as New Hampshire, almost into Canada and killing their local young population. So. So I think that, you know, for, for states like New Hampshire and their voters to say, you know, this is an important issue to us. It's not just a Texas or Arizona issue. It's an issue in the North as well, throughout the country. Tom, that's something I've been saying and we've been saying for quite a number of podcasts now. You know, people need to take this political filter that they look through and put it aside and start to look at the condition of this country. And in particular, its borders, which I've been banging this drum since I started doing this podcast and doing this live radio show down here in Jacksonville. This is redefining our cities. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And it's going to resonate through the country. I do want to mention something else, what's going on in California. I may have mentioned it in a prior podcast. The governor, governor in California, in his omnipotent wisdom, has decided to give more than three quarters of a million illegal migrants in his state complete comprehensive health care, regardless of age. I have my usual simple question I'd like to ask. Who's paying for that? People are leaving California, this beautiful, picturesque state, in a record number. Something else, Tom, I want to bring up. Uh, you may have heard Jamie Dimon's assessment of Donald Trump on a CNBC interview. I happen to have caught it live. Right. He said he was right on NATO. 
right on China. He grew the economy. Uh, his, his tax reform was spot on. And just to remind everyone, Jamie Dimon is a Democrat. He's a Democrat donor. He's the head of the largest banking institution in this country, Chase Bank. Maybe the world, for that matter. I can't really speak to that, but I know he's in charge of the largest banking institution in this country. You heard these remarks yourself, Tom, I assume? Yes, I did. Interesting, isn't it, to hear this come from the other side? I mean, every now and then we do prop somebody up that tells the truth. You know, I speak to a lot of people about the condition of this country. And, you know, the... The response I get all the time is Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. I got the memo on Donald Trump. Lacks a little dignity, decorum. You know, whether he has what it takes in that regard to be in the White House is, is open to discussion. But I've said this before. Just review the podcasts. Everybody's hatred for him has overshadowed things he did that were favorable to this country. And by the way, Jamie Dimon also said he was right on the border. I don't know where we're going with this today, guys. You know, not only Diamond, Lou, but you notice that the president of Hungary, Viktor Orban, recently in an interview with Tucker Carlson said the same thing, that the war in Ukraine and, and the things that are going on in Europe could be fixed by Trump immediately. If he gets to be president, he'll fix it right away. Now, that's coming from a president in Hungary who has been on the outs with the EU leadership, let's say, the other countries who have been saying, all of you subsidiary European Union countries, you have to take these migrants, you have to take your share. And Orban and, uh, and a couple of others, but Orban has been the most outspoken saying, we will not. We will not allow people to come into our country who are going to upset or degrade our Judeo-Christian Judeo ethic in this country. We are not going to allow that. They'll come in this country like they've done other countries in Europe and throughout the world where they don't assimilate to your country's values. They want you to assimilate to their country's values. And Orban just took on the EU and said, we're not going to take them. We don't care what you say. I'm going to protect my country. So there's your version of Hungary first rather than the globalist agenda. And, uh, and you know, Trump, in response to his endorsement, um, just recently basically said he admires the fact that Orban doesn't say United States first or the globalist first or the EU first. He says Hungary first. The people of Hungary come first. And he respects that completely. You know, it's interesting, Tom, also, if you listen to the daily conversations through the 24 hour news cycle, they're in this big debate, you know, trying to put together this bill that's going to fund <laughs> The Ukraine, which I want you to speak to in a moment, because this has been a, a corrupt entity since its inception and continues to be corrupt. But they talk about the funding of the Ukraine to another 60 or 65 billion dollars on top of the 115 or 120 billion dollars they've already received. But securing our borders is predicated on giving the Ukraine this money. I'm, I'm a little confused as to why these are not separately discussed issues. Let me see so I have it right, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to me quite clearly. Our government will not fund. They're acknowledging that we need to secure the border suddenly. But they will not fund this unless the Republican demographic of this government agrees to allocate funding to the tune of 60 or $65 billion to the Ukraine. If this doesn't insult your intelligence and your sense of decency, I don't know what will. But now that you brought me into the topic of the Ukraine, Tom, I blame you for that. How You're is welcome. it that we, we <laughs> how is it that we're continuing to fund this mess? We've talked about pensions, correct, Tom? Correct. Uh, paying correct. their civil servants. I mean, where is this money going? Number one, do we really know if it's going to the intended targets? Because it's been mired in corruption. You can just go back to President Obama's days when Hunter Biden was doing best business there when his father was the vice president. This is how out of touch we are, folks. And I'm going to say this to you, and I want Tom you to speak further on this Ukraine topic. If your hate for Donald Trump is so strong that you're prepared to destroy and harm the safety and the security of this nation, then you vote in the way that you think your conscience wants you to. But Tom, in regards to this Ukraine discussion, what do you think is going on here? I think it's pretty obvious, Lou, and nobody wants to look at what's the evidence right in front of their face. 
and I'm talking about the Democrats in the House for beginners, you have physical evidence by the committee, you know, Jamie Comer's committee investigating the amount of money that the Bidens have taken in, tens of millions from China, tens of millions from the Ukraine, from Romania, from the, the white former wife of the mayor of Moscow. And these countries get special consideration from the Biden administration and from Joe Biden in particular as a result of that was money. Those countries well spent money, put that money in the pocket of the Bidens. And yeah, let the Bidens put it with their tell uh, 10 computer or um, corporate entities, LLCs, so they could move the money around and try to keep it hidden. But nevertheless, the Republican committee in the House is in possession of documents of evidence of the bank transfers that went into the Biden crime family bank accounts. And then they moved it around and all of that. And then people say, well, that doesn't mean Joe Biden got any of the money. No, that's right. On, on the salary of a senator all these years, he's able to amass three huge houses in Delaware, even right on the ocean. Um, all of this wealth came out of where? Well, now we've seen where and have the evidence of from where it came with regard to China, Ukraine, and a few other countries. But Ukraine in particular, they're getting the payback for their huge investment in Joe Biden and in the Biden family. Everything they want, they've been getting from him. No critical questions. And, and for a long time, Ukraine has been regarded by experts from all over the world as probably the single most corrupt country in Europe. Nothing's changed. We still have evidence of that. We have evidence of Zelensky, the president, and many officials from his government and from his military, civilian and military officials, who have pocketed tens of millions of dollars, bought expensive homes and yachts all over the world, basically. Zelensky himself, the question is, where's he gonna retire to? You know, when he gets, when the people of Ukraine get fed up with how many of their millions of their population have been killed in their war or have left the country and gone to neighboring European countries, well, he's going to have to retire. Should it be in his rich home in Miami? Should it be in Cyprus? Should it be in Italy? He's got all of these big, how, where'd that come from? He was just a comedian when he got elected president. And he's still a comedian because he's laughing at us all the way to the bank. And that doesn't change. And I think it's because the Biden, Biden himself is so deep in his pocket that <laughs> Ukraine feels like they own us. And in a way, they do. No, Tom, I, I have a, a rather open-ended question for everyone that's funding the Ukraine. So <laughs> when we cross this threshold of giving him another 60 or $65 billion, is that the last of it? Or are we going to dip into the taxpayer's pocket in this country again to pay them some more money as we continue to neglect the borders? You know, this conversation, you know, part of what they're doing is they're capitalizing on the fact that the, most of the people in this country are just not paying attention. That's how I surmise this. And I mentioned earlier, Tom, use the term complacent. I say indifferent, distracted. You know, I don't know how to quantify the mindset of the American public, but guys, this is our defining moment. And we're not here to tell you who to vote for. We hope you're intelligent enough to see the forest for the trees. I hope you're smart enough to come in from the rain, as I like to tell people. We're at a crossroad. But Tom, can I ask you a question about China? How much different is it with China with this administration? Uh, it's not different. It's just that there is not an ongoing war to send tens of millions of dollars to them for whatever purpose. So China, you know, it, again, it's been well documented. The millions of dollars that that uh, were coordinated by Hunter Biden to have the money come in and go into the Biden coffers. And you see you see Joe Biden taking a number of positions favorable to China ever since. And it's not like, you know, the, the investigations by the FBI were curtailed. A number of, of issues with China have been curtailed because they've won favor with the Biden administration by sending these millions of dollars, uh, you know, not to some kind of tax relief fund in the United States or any of that, 
directly into the Biden's bank accounts. And this is all tracked and traced money by James Comer and Jim Jordan, am I correct? They, well, with they, regard to China, it's specifically traced uh, by Peter Schweitzer, who has an investigative team. And I've known Peter a long time and we're friends. And he's documented the money that came and uh, came to the Bidens. So this isn't just, just a Republican issue. Schweitzer is running an investigative group, uh, many investigators, financial investigators who have discovered this and have identified the exact transactions and exactly where those transactions originated in China from people affiliated with the Chinese intelligence service or the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the PLA. But in any event, all high ranking officials in the Communist China, uh, Chinese Party, CCP. Just amazing. We're going to take a quick break, guys. When we come back, we're going to brush up against this topic called January 6th. And I, I'm a little concerned about the usage of this term insurrection. We need to more clearly define it for you. Maybe ask a question that if anyone, president, anyone was guilty of this, would you be charged? We'll be right back, guys. And I want to remind you, you can communicate uh, with us through Operation Truth Official at gmail.com. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. I am TJ Stone, the producer of Operation Truth. And I'm just taking a moment here to remind you to go follow us at Operation Truth Official on TikTok. And you can find us at Operation Truth Official on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We don't do as much on Instagram uh, for reasons. On X, formerly known as Twitter, you can find us at Operation Truth and the number seven, Operation Truth seven. And always email us at Operation Truth Official at gmail.com. Be a part of this conversation. Join the operation. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. With us, as always, Tom Fuentes, former assistant director of the FBI. Um, we're, we're hearing a lot about January 6th. In fact, there is almost a day that goes by that where you don't hear something referred to regarding January 6th. And I want to say this quite simply. If the president of the United States, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, or whomever engaged in insurrection was translated to potentially overthrowing this government, they should be charged accordingly, quite candidly. I mean, independent of politics. Um, I'm first struggling to fully understand if that was, in fact, an insurrection, because an insurrection lends itself, as I understand it, Tom, I'm going to come to you in a moment to clear this up for me, because nobody's better suited than you, that they were attempting to overthrow the government. I don't know how you would do that if you were unarmed. And by the way, guys, I heard nothing about people entering the Capitol with weapons. I, never, I didn't hear that one single time. The only uh referral or reference that was made regarding the use of a weapon was done so by a capitol policeman who shot, a, shot an unarmed woman which to be very candid with you and tom and i are both out of the law enforcement community it went unaddressed for the most part but if if donald trump committed an insurrection or was involved in promoting an insurrection he should be charged but a bigger question is what is the insurrection really what does that mean and why wasn't he charged? Why are you continuously allowed to accuse him of something you're not prepared to criminally charge him with? Tom? Not just him, Lou, but you have over a thousand defendants of the January 6th uh, investigation. Not one of them was charged with insurrection. Now, the reason the word insurrection is even in this debate is because it's taken right out of the 14th Amendment, Section 3 which says that if you were involved in an insurrection against the United States, you cannot run for a national office, senator, congressman, other national offices. Now, that was put in the 14th Amendment, which was passed 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War. It was put there because as the country reunified North and South into back being the United States, the fear was that many of these Confederate generals or, or leaders like Jefferson Davis or generals like Robert E. Lee or, or James Longstreet or others would go back to the South and run for office and get elected because they were still very, very popular in the South, the Confederate states. So the idea was that they were not to be rewarded, they were to be prohibited 
by the constitutional amendment that they did engage, they did take up arms against the United States of America, and they were not to be allowed to run for office. So that was 1868. So now when you have, you know, the riot that takes place at the Capitol on January 6, 2001, the Democrats deliberately insert the word first day. This was an insurrection. It's an it's on a par with Pearl Harbor or the Civil War or any other calamity the United States has faced, especially politically or militarily. And therefore, you know, we've got to go after the people that did this. Well, interesting, as you said, nobody took guns in there or cannons or any explosives or anything like that into the Capitol that day or near the Capitol. Many of the of the uh, 1,200 defendants that have been charged didn't even enter the building. They were outside, you know, in the, in the fenced in area and didn't go in. So but the idea and the Democrats are just so skilled at this that right away insert the term. This was an insurrection. And then, oh, but isn't that against the law? Isn't that prohibited in the 14th Amendment insurrection? So they weren't smart enough to actually charge anybody with insurrection, or maybe they were smart since nobody took weapons in to actually conduct an insurrection, but they were smart enough to use the term, even to this day, two, three years later, to say Trump was an insurrectionist. He inspired this, he encouraged people, you know, all of this type of thing. And that's where it comes from. Well, you know, Tom, I, I, I make it simple. I, if this was an attempt to overthrow the government, it was rather poorly planned. What I really got a kick out of was, was having the opportunity to look at some of the video of people that were perusing the Capitol, which we used to be able to do, ladies and gentlemen, before we went into these heightened states of alert. And they were taking pictures and you could see the uh, Capitol Police standing off to the side, sometimes talking to one another. It didn't seem to be much urgency. For anyone that came into the Capitol, and touched police officer, you need to go to jail. For the knucklehead that thought it was appropriate to put his feet up on the desk of Nancy Pelosi, you need to be held accountable. I don't know to what extent, but that was a knucklehead move. And you have to understand, you got to be a big boy and take responsibility. A lot of people had entered that building and were outside. Some of them were acting like tourists. And if you understood and could see, a lot of them were being accommodated at times by the Capitol Police. This has become an interesting country. This White House of ours is the, is the people's house. You used to be able to go visit the White House. Now they've got fences on top of fences on top of fences on the perimeter. And I'm not going to even get into the fact they had a pro-Palestinian demonstration that basically damaged one of the fences, which is attempting to damage or enter the White House. Didn't hear much about that. Didn't serve the right political narrative. But, you know, what happened to our country? I've been in the Capitol. Tom, I know you have a number of times. You know, everybody in this country should be able to visit the White House and the Capitol to understand the majesty of this nation and the people that built this country and what they stood for. Guys, I want to get into a, a discussion with you again about this thing about population and country. And Tom and I don't agree with this. I believe we've overpopulated the country. I also believe it was never the intent of the founding fathers to allow everybody, regardless of where you are from the planet, on the planet, to come into this country. How are we supposed to accommodate everybody's likes and dislikes, ethnic differences, religious differences, cultural differences, uh, lifestyle differences? Where does this notion come from? The French gave us the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s. We stuck it in New York Harbor. Give us your tired, your poor, your wretched masses, learning, yearning to breathe. I got it. But how did that translate to opening the? No country in the history of civilization has ever allowed people to converge on it the way we have with the notion that we're going to keep everybody happy and be able to take care of everyone. We are in a crisis, ladies and gentlemen, but I want to give you some good news. We're the most resilient nation in the history of civilization. I believe we can stop on a dime and change direction. Maybe that's what this next election is about. I am not telling you who to vote for. I would never assume that I have that right. But I am asking you to put down your political lens, your likes and your dislikes personally. Look at the, the path your country's on. We are in dire straits. Our children's future is in peril. The future of this country as a whole is in peril. 
Tom and I talk about these topics. They all intersect. Same issue. The future for our children. Look at what we've done to this country. You know, Tom, you're a historian and, and you're quite knowledgeable in the Kennedy assassination. I spend an enormous amount of time uh, listening to the, the speeches and the addressments by John Kennedy. I didn't hear this man once demean, degrade, defile, or criticize anyone or anything, even in a constructive manner. He was so focused on speaking to the problem and the addressment to the problem. This man had dignity, he had clarity, he had class. I almost feel like we're living with game show hosts. And I hate to say that about Donald Trump, but I feel that way towards him also. You have to have some decorum if you're going to lead this country. So all of these people posing as elected officials, to all the people in the entertainment industry, athletics, whatever, you are role models for the young people. Look at how you conduct yourselves. <clears throat> Look at the way you address one another, the way you demean one another. I'm beating my brains in trying to teach my children to speak to people with dignity and respect, regardless of whether or not you agree with them. And they're doing exactly the opposite and leading the charge. And they always get away from me is the media. The media is at the root of this problem. They are so powerful. They're controlling your narrative and your optic. You only get to hear and see what they decide you're going to hear and see. That's the simple, sad reality of this thing. You know, if Donald Trump by some chance becomes the president, I hope he has some speeches of reconciliation at some point. Maybe apologize for all the people he spoke to inappropriately, because that's the real fly in the ointment with this guy. If you don't believe me, go go talk to Jamie Dimon. Tom, I know that, you know, you you feel the same way about the direction of the country as I do. You know, if we don't throw the brakes on, Regarding the manner in which we do business in this country, we're not going to have a country. It's going to be unrecognizable. And Tom, I want to say something about Texas right now. People need to watch what's going on in Texas. Texas is going head to head with the federal government on a daily basis. I'm wondering at what point does Texas say, we no longer want to be part of the union because your concerns are not our concerns. Kind of like what you're talking about, Tom, with the people, the Hungarian president. It's just the Hungarian president, ladies and gentlemen, in Europe, by the way, that's pushing back on, on a certain demographic. It's um, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Ireland, Sweden, Germany. Everybody's suddenly concerned about who they let into the country. Does that sound familiar? The very same people that Europe's having a problem with, we're letting into our country. Do you think the problem won't rear its head here? It is. And I want to say something to you, and I'm not Islamophobic. I have friends that are Muslim, and I know they're good people, just like I have friends that are Asian that are good people, and Puerto Rican that are good people, and Black that are good people. But the reality of this situation is this is becoming a three-ring circus in this country. We're letting people in by the millions we know nothing about. I don't know what else you need to hear ring in your ear to get that through your head. And that's not just being said by me, and don't get try to figure out my political affiliation because I don't have one. It's being said by everyone with a brain in their head. Tom, you you feeling on this issue? Well, I don't a hundred percent agree, but for the most part, I do. And I think what part that, don't you agree with? I, I, I'm curious to know what part you don't. Well, agree let's with, let's go back to Hungary was under immense and still under immense pressure from the, the EU itself. Now, when you mentioned the other countries that have argued against, like Poland and, and some of the other ones, they haven't gone to the extent that Hungary did for the last 10 years, where Hungary said when they were being commanded by the EU leadership, take in all these Syrian immigrants. And President of Hungary said, no, I'm not doing it. We don't care what you say. We're not destroying our country by bringing people in that don't share our values. So that's still an ongoing thing in Europe. And, uh, and I think it's going to continue. They've had more and more evidence in the countries that let in millions of Syrians that it did not benefit their country in the long run and did a lot to hurt their country. So I think that's one of them. But I think as far as the, you know, the size of our population and all of that, no, when we let in 10 or 15 illegal uh, migrants like we've done in the Biden administration, you're right. That's way too many. We're not equipped for that. They're not going to assimilate. They don't care if they do or don't assimilate. But, you know, since the country was founded, most of the immigration has been designed to basically vet the people coming in 
and I, and it's a very serious vetting process. My wife and I just went through this about six years ago or so uh, when she became a U.S. citizen. She's from Canada, and you know the 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 vetting process that she went through is huge. It is very diligent. The number of interviews, the physical exams, the record checks, record checks from every country she ever lived in to provide certified copies of her if she had a criminal history or if she didn't have it, but certified copies from their law enforcement showing that she did not. So all of those things were serving us very well for the most part. But under Biden, we're letting in these 10, 15, 20 million, depending who you listen to, of people, no vetting, no criminal record checks. And, and not just criminal record checks, physicals. She had to have a detailed physical at a facility approved by the U.S. State Department to show she was not bringing in, this is before COVID, to show she's not bringing in some contagious or, or some disease that's going to be a burden on the country. But she had to prove that she had insurance coverage when she came in. And this is be my wife. Of course, we had insurance company, but she had to prove it. So she wasn't going to become a burden to the state. Now, you brought up earlier the Denver hospital that's going bankrupt because no one coming into the population has to prove their financial capability or that they have the insurance if they go to a hospital to cover the expenses. It's just the, the hospital has to cover it. They have to treat the people that come in the emergency room doors. And if they can't afford it, the taxpayers of Colorado will fund it. And that's true with the other cities as well. If the people can't afford it, they can't afford expensive hotels in New York City, the taxpayers in New York will fund it. All of, all of these issues uh, would not be the problem that they are if we still had some kind of a vetting and some type of immigration process. Now, having gone through it, it took a couple of years. It was very serious. The steps were very diligently conducted by the State Department. So when they talk about immigration reform, to me, that means if you want to find a way to speed it up, make it more efficient, more computerized, whatever, that's one thing. But talking about immigration policy has nothing to do with the southern border. That's just a lack of policy. Let anybody in that, that uh, wants to cross that border. And I think that, you know, we are going to pay the price for that. The average citizen and the people that are supporting this administration need to stop and think what part of the population that supports the Biden and, you know, their administration, what's going to happen when all these people come? Whose jobs are they going to compete with? Whose services are they going to take away? Whose housing are they going to take away? Whose education are they going to impact on? That's where the issue comes in. And the policy just rolls on and you hear everybody on the Democratic say, no, no problem. Let them in. I want to ask you a question, Tom, and I don't think there's anybody better suited to answer this question than you, based on your extensive background and your commitment to keeping this country safe. Do you believe that the safety and the security of this country has been compromised and that we are at grave risk? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you have. You know, you, know you agree with Christopher Ray. I you know agree. That, right? Yeah, with that. <laughs> Well, you know, occasionally he can tell the truth. Um, you know, he said that, what, six, eight months ago, that the open border is a threat to national security. Now, that's before the, uh, the Hamas, Israel, Hezbollah, the war in the Middle East. Now you have information that Hamas and Hezbollah have strongholds in Mexico. That puts them a walking distance from coming into the United States. So... On that issue, Ray was right. Now, what he did about it, you know, even after making that statement, by the way, he makes that statement, I think last spring sometime, maybe in the summer, but he makes the statement that the open border is a threat to national security. But in speeches after that, he echoes what Biden's been saying, the greatest threat to the domestic security of the, of the United States are white supremacists, MAGA, Trump supporters. So... Here you have Biden make that statement, and basically Christopher Ray goes along with that. Yeah, that's true. Those guys are bad. And the, the J6 protesters, we had to keep going after them. You know, we've arrested 1,200. There could be another 1,000 of them out there. We got to keep going and keep rounding people up, which, by the way, that's a separate issue. 
the uh, the J6 investigations are designed purposely so that in the future, you talked about people will get dis disillusioned or want their state to secede from the union or want to, you know, announce their their displeasure with the government as a citizen. Well, they've just gotten a really good example of what could happen to you if you do it. You might have your freedom taken away, your house taken away, you name it, if you dare to question the federal government. And in this case, you have people that, are, that went into jail from J6 that didn't even go in the building, never announced publicly they were insurrectionists. You know, they stayed out in, in the fenced in area. And of course, the FBI using the technology from the phone companies that the are pinging off the, the antenna system and the bank records and all of that type of thing. So you so you have the government basically saying if you showed up that day, you're liable to be arrested and get jail sentences. You well, know that there's you... some people, there's some people that were locked up three years ago that haven't had a trial yet. Everybody's ignoring that. The Speedy Trial Act is for defendants to be prosecuted in a in a quick manner. Some of these people have been in jail for three and a half years, sometimes in solitary confinement. And this is unbelievable. And, well, and as we said well, earlier, none were ever charged with insurrection or going against the government. None of them showed up with guns or cannons or explosives at, at the uh, Capitol that day. So this is what's going and it's still ongoing. So, yeah, the FBI all this time has been paying more attention and they've made no bones about it, that the J6 investigation <laughs> is one of the largest in its history. Now, when I was in the bureau, and participated in some of the investigations at that time that were regarded as the most extensive in history, such as the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, that particular bombing, I think the FBI covered something like 5 million leads worldwide in that investigation. Because of the involvement of McVeigh and a couple of his military buddies, that investigation went all over the world, where the different bases where these guys had been stationed. Did they rile up other people? at those locations to participate. So, so we've had huge investigations, not to mention September 11th. That's an unbelievable, hu unbelievably huge investigation. But now to say that the J6 investigation is one of the biggest the FBI has ever conducted, well, I think that's going beyond the pale compared to the other threats we actually face. I hate to say this, Tom, but um, it sounds like based on everything you've just said, You've outlined what a tyrannical government sounds like and looks like, and that bumps into the Second Amendment, which is a concern of the Founding Fathers. Guys, we're going to wrap this for today. Uh, this has been Operation Truth. This has been Tom Fuentes, myself, Lou Colombo. We hope you clearly understand that we speak to you, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as men that love this country, appreciate this country, and we don't take this country for granted. I've had the good fortune, as Tom has, to have traveled not only this country, but the world. And I know what we have, and I know we're on the brink of losing it. Next podcast, we're going to talk about the TSA and the different sets of rules when you pass through them. This has been Operation Truth. I encourage you to communicate with us through Operation Truth Official at gmail.com. And um, we're also going to get back into the borders next time, so be prepared. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.